incredibly beautiful melody that comes at this point in Rhapsody in Blue is presented three times. First, it's presented in the orchestra. Then it's presented again by the orchestra with piano accompaniment. And then it's finally presented just in the piano. So we really get to enjoy this theme in a lot of different ways. The, the accompaniment is fun because it's this part. What's brilliant about that is it's just a sort of a little chromatic noodling of a couple of notes, but it takes on slightly different meaning with each harmony. First, it shows up as a kind of a dissonant note to be resolved. There's the resolution, here's the dissonance. Then on a different note, it's di dissonant in a different way. And then here, it's almost part of the chord. And then it takes us back to so that's an absolutely brilliant way of, of, of adding something extra to this melody. It's such a joy to participate in tone bass and provide these lessons on music that I love to play so much. But I have to say, it's also really fun to be a tone bass customer. I just find this an astounding resource. And I've been telling all of my students and other young musicians and older musicians and anyone who's interested in how this repertoire works and how to play it, sign up for tone bass. So the first time the pianist gets to do it is the orchestra's played this big tune, and the piano comes in along with trumpet. I generally look at the conductor here because the conductor's really trying to keep everything going, including the trumpet. And the conductor wants to be able to tell the trumpet exactly how to pace that, how to move ahead a little bit in the middle, how to really be expansive at the end. So I try to go along with that, and that's part of the process. Um, then it happens with the next iteration of the melody. And that last chord, by the way, is not notated in the part, but I always play it because I'm sort of into things being full circle and finishing, and it's so loud in the orchestra, it doesn't really matter, it just feels better to play it. That's the harmony that's, that's there. Then in the third iteration, uh, the music goes in a different uh, uh, way. So suddenly we hear this in the orchestra, which is clearly the tune, and the pianist is accompanying with a slightly offbeat rhythm. And I try to give that you know, kind of like with the banjo effect, you know, a little bit of top and, and slightly brash. And at this point, the orchestra drops out, and this is actually the beginning now, uh, even though we're in the middle of a phrase, but it's the beginning of a long piano cadenza, kind of the big piano cadenza, which is going to incorporate that beautiful theme it's going to incorporate the whole thing that got Gershon all excited about hearing the sounds of the train. Uh, and then it's eventually going to bring the orchestra back for the finale So, and, and to, to finish off the piece. So at this moment, I go from dry to pedaled, which has been a little bit of a theme of how I approach sections of this piece. And I just love that because it sets you up for this beautiful sound and this kind of transition. Here's the third presentation of the theme. And here's the accompaniment. And here's another accompaniment. I would call this one of the most sophisticated, tricky parts of the whole piece, actually, because you've got the melody here. You have accompaniment like genuine background chords. So you just have that to deal with. 
After this long note, I would always start melodically from a slightly lesser dynamic and grow. And then you have to fill in this chord and this chord. This, you play the chord and this arpeggiated figure should kind of emerge from inside the sound, right? It's sort of a way of just elongating the sound. I mean, you know that this is a big issue for any composer writing for piano. So if you hold any chord long enough, it's just gonna vanish. This is why the Baroque composers loved trills so much, you know, because it just kept the sound going. So here's another way of keeping the sound going. takes us back to the theme. In the meantime, there's a lot happening in the left hand. We have this, and then we have a bass line, and then we have to combine a low grace note with that previously introduced accompaniment chromatic figure. A much further away grace note, and one more. Notice that because of the fact, and Gershwin loved doing this, he loved finding a pattern that did not line up with the bar lines, right? So if you have this pattern, here it starts on a D sharp, here it starts on a D natural, here on the C sharp, so that's a little bit you have to wrap your brain around that. So you combine all of these elements. And that's actually quite a bit to worry about. And then we get into the next uh, iteration with the new harmony. It's that inner voice that makes this so beautiful to me, you know? The fact that we have this and this. And I mean, that's sort of the genius of Gershwin right there, you know? That, that, how that little chromatic moment gives us such tasty, beautiful, beautiful harmony. Then suddenly we have something difficult in a different way because the left hand is having to do this business again. And we talked about that. Memorize the right hand without being able to having to look at it, focus on the left hand, and that's all great. And still he's done us the favor of landing on two black keys. So good, good for George, this is great. Then unfortunately we have to do it finally, the last time on white keys. And that's really challenging. That always makes me nervous. We're not only going down on the keyboard, but we're also pulling away from here to play white keys and back up again. And you know, my batting average on that is often not perfect. If you're nervous about it, which sometimes I am, depending on how I'm feeling, you can slightly delay it. kind of get away with it. You can't delay every single one, but maybe if you delay the first few, you're, you start to get familiar with the distance and you feel more, more comfortable and you, and you go on. And then thankfully we have a super easy version of the same music to finish off. And now we have this totally new thing and it's so pianistic. It sounds really impressive. It's not that difficult because of the way the left hand is just playing a single note and the right hand is dealing with the chords. There's a little bit of, you know, getting that. But once you have the coordination of that, and that's like a statement that's sort of a question, and then I like to play that with a tiny bit of retard at the end. And now the train's gonna start up. And this is great, because you can just picture Gershwin sitting on the train 
from New York to Boston and a train starting up like this. fun to play and um, he's actually written in the score uh, agitato e misterioso which is very nice to put that in Italian but then he also put in English start slowly and gradually increase in speed so one of the things to keep in mind there is that this chord really requires your hand to be at this angle this chord not quite so much this one a lot it's just, if you want your hand to be placed in what I'd call the right ergonomic position so that you've got this one finger on the black key and everything else is on the white keys, you have to play all those notes and that's your hand position. It can't really be like this or it's going to be very awkward. So, so you really have to put the elbow into your body and have this sort of almost a right angle here. So when you get to the second chord, you can do it with three or four. And back. You also have the option that this note could be played with four or with five. I actually prefer using five on both. And then we have basically the same thing here. The only major difference being that this one requires your thumb on a black key, so that requires even more of this rotating around and, and having more of this angle here. And this is much easier. These are the same harmonies, but now your left hand's jumping around a bit. Um, and then we get to a place where, and again, I play most of this pretty dry, you know, like just, just to get the clacking metallic kind of sound. Here, I use a little pedal. Just, just on that second note. Just a little pedal. I still play it with a kind of a, uh, an attack. It's a bit of a nuisance place where suddenly after doing so many of these, you have to switch up to find a different place. Question mark. Lots of pedal. Lots of rubato. Remember, you're playing on your own. There's no orchestra to answer to here. Then, so this should be very brilliant. And, uh, and pointed. This is all thankfully mostly black keys. Then you've got white keys. This is a little harder. Then you have this crazy run and you know at the end of that run, Horns and trombones have to come in right with you precisely. And this is always a place that gets, uh, another place that gets conductors a little nervous. But it's really pretty straightforward if the conductor's just listening for six beats and then you go. So it's. And it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, go. They're going. And while you're. And, and all of this, and that's that's all great fun. And then you have to be aware of, for example, the full orchestra comes in with the and you're doing. Uh, they're supposed to drop the piano and do a crescendo here, and it's nice to slightly mirror that, but not to play too soft because you want to be heard. You just want to be heard through this whole thing. And once you get through that, everybody in sort of lockstep is doing it. This 
the best way to play it for me is I actually anchor my arms on the side of my body and then so that everything is just in, is locked and I can move up and down the, the keyboard without thinking too much. There's no need to, to have this kind of motion that you often would use in big octave passages. You just want to stay kind of locked. And because the distance is different, most octave passages are like this, where your arms have to be further apart from each other. But in this case, there's literally a third between the thumbs. So you can kind of anchor yourself. chord. That chord is so incredibly New York and so American and so brash and so loud in the orchestra that I usually play it like this. And even then you can barely hear it, but it's something, you know, I feel like that clanging sound kind of works. Then it's great because uh, Gershwin's written in the score Agitato, and at this point there's this kind of inevitable sense that things are building and building. This is material we had in the very opening, but it's slightly different. So memorize carefully, analyze both versions, and you'll see that they're not quite the same. Right here, there's a different sequence. So this passage here is again with the whole orchestra. It's molto marcato, so you want to have a lot of this energy. There's also typically a retard that happens, and so you really just want to follow the conductor, listen to the orchestra. If you get a tiny bit ahead or behind, be prepared to adjust immediately. <laughs> Then I take a little artistic license. What happens here is the orchestra goes and I hate not being a part of that. Uh, and I also feel like that needs something. So the something I do is this. And then I start playing where I'm supposed to start playing after that. Gershwin writes something inexplicably weak. He writes, which is awkward for a lot of reasons. It's a slightly awkward thing to play in the right hand. It, it's actually too slow for the tempo. This has no hope of being heard when the orchestra is playing full out. And so I always just kind of improvise something there. Um, I sort of do something like that. Uh, it, it comes out a little differently every time, but the idea is that it's brilliant, right? And something like that, and then so what? I what I what what was the something I was doing? You probably want to know that. I'm going kind of that. Sometimes adding a few notes along the way, uh, something like that, but just something brilliant. Of course, it does do a transition here from 16th notes to 8th notes. And the orchestra does yum, bum, 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 and then you come in with something. And again, I do something slightly more dramatic than what's in the, what's in the score. No idea. No, that's basically the right idea, it's just as long as it's massive. and. Instead of this, I play just a low F octave. There's this really great trill here, and it doesn't last very long, but conductors will wait for you if you want it to last long. It's no problem, because it's really effective, I think. a 
grace note in the left hand. I also do a grace chord in the right hand. And now you should know when you're playing this last grand statement that the orchestra has a very elaborate series of instructions to do a diminuendo and a crescendo and a diminuendo and a crescendo, partly to allow you to come through uh, and also for dramatic effect. So make sure that's happening if you're playing it with orchestra. Of course, if you're playing it with second piano, they're gonna play a chord and, and disappear and that's fine. But the orchestra can sustain like, you know, crazy. So you wanna make sure they don't. You wanna make sure they actually follow those instructions so you can be heard. <laughs> 